Universities. Uh, my name is Kwang Woo An. I am assistant professor in the Division of Biostatistics. Uh, today, kind of, I want to talk about analyzing discrete data or analyzing categorical data. So uh, this talk uh, doesn't have any kind of financial uh, financial interest to the audience, and then I don't have any financial interest to the audience. Okay, this is the outline. So first of all, kind of, I'll describe the, uh, I'll explain the types of data, and then uh, I'll describe the categorical data next. So and then kind of we will uh, investigate kind of how to uh, express kind of categorical data uh, graphically. And then we will uh, investigate kind of three uh, measures of association for bion uh, binary outcomes. So those are uh, relative uh, risk difference, relative risk, and odds ratio. So uh, that will be kind of main part in this talk. And then at the end, kind of we will have uh, comparing uh, two proportions with kind of uh, uh, small sample sizes. So kind of we will use the Fisher zigzag test for that. And then we will have a brief kind of conclusion. So the data uh, you can divide the, uh, the data into two uh, two uh, two groups. So one thing is categorical data. Uh, the other one is continuous data. So in the categorical data, uh, typically kind of they have two kinds of categorical data. So the first one is nominal data. So there is no ordering. So for example, race and types of disease or eye color. So there is no ordering. But the, on the other hand, kind of there is ordinal data. So for example, uh, toxicity grade or disease stage. So disease stage four uh, kind of indicate kind of severe condition than the disease stage one or disease stage two, something like that. So in that case, kind of there is ordering. On the other hand, kind of there continuous data kind of exist. So kind of, for example, blood pressure or age, white blood cell count, those are kind of continuous data. So in this talk, kind of we will focus on uh, categorical data, especially uh, binary outcomes. So in reality, we have kind of a lot of kind of binary, uh, binary data. For example, uh, yes, no outcome. So do you agree or not, something like that, or gender problem. So male versus female. And then response versus no response to uh, treatment. So the treatment is working or not, something like that. And then or alive or dead. So those are kind of bi uh, binary data examples. Then how can you describe categorical data? Uh, there are two typical ways to describe categorical data. The first one is frequency. So frequency is the uh, number of patients in a specific category. So you can just count the number of patients or number of children or adults so in a specific category. That's the frequency. And then some people uh, may also use kind of proportion or relative frequencies. So in this case, uh, you can simply calculate the proportions. So for example, uh, just kind of the number of patients in a specific category uh, divided by the total number of kind of patients. That's uh, that will be proportion. And then also you can express proportion uh, as the percentages, so kind of some people kind of may not, may, uh, may not like kind of 0.7, 0.9, but um, instead kind of uh, they want to see 70% or 90% or something like that. But um, uh, proportions and percentages, uh, they are basically the same. So here, here is kind of, we have one example. So this is the study of the use uh, medical care by adults experiencing chest pain in the past year. So the total number of uh, adults or patients is 302. And then we have three categories. So the first category is uh, the patients or adults kind of saw the doctor in the past year. So there are 102 uh, adults out of kind of 300, uh, 302. And then for the second category is the they saw the doctor, but they're not in the past year. So we have 83 uh, adults uh, out of 302. And then the last category is uh, they had never seen any doctors. So uh, we have kind of 117 out of 302. So those are uh, just frequencies. But um, also, you can calculate the proportion or relative frequency. 
So for example, uh, for the first category, you can simply calculate 102 divided by the total population, uh, total sample size, uh, 302. That will be 0 0.34. And then for the second category, it's 83 divided by 302. That will be 0 0.27. So if you want to use percentages, then it will be simply 34%, 27%, and 39%. So if you sum up all uh, relative frequencies, then there will be should be one or one hundred percent. So we wanna uh, describe uh, this data graphically. So uh, there are a number of ways to uh, express this data graphically, but um, uh, I recommend the kind of bar chart. So bar chart uh, consists of kind of several bars. So each bar represents each category. So kind of there are two ways to express that. So one thing is just using frequencies. The other one is using proportion or percentages. So the this is the first graph. So I used the uh, uh, frequency or count. So let's look at the first category, ND never seen. So we have uh, in the previous table, kind of we have 117. So in this bar chart, kind of this height of the bar represents the frequency 117. And then for the second category, we have 102. So this height corresponding to the kind of 102. So and so on. Or you can use kind of percentage or proportion. So in this graph, kind of I use the uh, percentages. So for the ND never seen, is 39%. So if you go back to our original table, uh, this is 39%. And then the next one is 34%. So you can see uh, this height is 34%. So this is a kind of one way to express kind of categorical data graphically, whereas sometimes kind of you may have one more factor or another factor. So let's assume uh, we have one more factor, that's the race. So black versus white, something like that. So if you look at the first two bars, so two bars represent the kind of MD never seen group. So in the MD never seen group, so about 60, 66% is black people and then 34% is white people. So if you sum up uh, those two bars, it'll be 100%. So, and then you can interpret the other uh, bars kind of in the same way. So next kind of we will uh, investigate kind of three measures of association. So this will be main part of this talk. So kind of we want to focus on our binary data. So basically yes or no outcome or kind of improved or not, something like that. So first one is the risk difference. Risk difference is kind of we want to compare two groups. So we will have two proportions. So we want to compare uh, those two proportions. So risk difference is the basically you can simply calculate the difference between two proportions. So that's it. That's the risk difference. And then on the other hand, kind of relative risk is really popular. So, kind of in contrast to uh, in, con in contrast to uh, risk difference, relative risk is to calculating just the ratio of two proportions. So the first proportion of getting disease divided by second proportion of getting disease, something like that. So that's the relative risk. And then the third one is the odd ratio. So actually in statistics, odd ratio is the most popular one and the most uh, recommended one. Uh, but um, uh, it may kind of hard to interpret it. So that's the disadvantage. But um, odd ratio is very similar to relative risk. So relative risk is the ratio of two proportions. And then odd ratio is the ratio of two odds. So we will look at the definition of odds kind of in a minute. So we want to compare kind of these two, uh, these three measures of associations. Okay, so let's look at the example. So this data was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1988. So they investigated the relationship between aspirin use and heart attacks. So it's a five-year uh, five uh, study design, and then it's also blind and randomized study. So the study, uh, study design was like this. The phys uh, physicians took uh, one aspirin or one placebo every other day, kind of for five years. And then they just count the number of heart attacks. 
So in the in the original paper, uh, they have uh, they had kind of three outcomes. Uh, kind of the first one is a fatal attack. The second one is non-fatal attack, and the third one is no attack. But then for this talk, we will combine the first two categories: fatal attack and non-fatal attack. So we will uh, represent those guys as the just heart attack. So this is the results they have. So they investigated uh, uh, 22,071 uh, physicians. And then placebo group, and there are two groups. So one thing is the placebo group, the other one is the uh, uh, aspirin group. So for the placebo group, there are 11,034 uh, physicians. And then for the aspirin group, there are 11,037 physicians. And then what's the proportion of kind of proportion of heart attacks? So for the placebo group, 189 divided by 11,034. That's the proportion for the uh, placebo group. Uh, for, the, uh, for the aspirin group, it's 104 uh, divided by 11,037 uh, physicians. That's the proportion for, th uh, for the aspirin group. So we want to compare uh, two proportions. Okay, so let's calculate the uh, actual proportion. So as I said, for the aspirin group, we had kind of 104 uh, heart attacks out of 11,037 physicians. So if you calculate this one, then you will have 0 0.009 or 0.9%. And then for the uh, placebo group, so it'll be kind of 189 divided by 11,034. So it will be 0.017 or 1.7%. The risk, uh, risk difference is really simple. So basically just calculate the difference between two proportions. So it's, it's basically the proportion from the first group minus proportion from the second group. So it will be 0.9% minus 1.7%. It will be kind of negative 0.8%. Uh, so that's the uh, risk difference. Then how to, uh, how can you interpret it, that result? So let's assume kind of uh, 1,000 patients uh, took aspirin. Then kind of this aspirin, this group kind of in this group kind of they will, uh, this would reduce the number of uh, heart attack by eight compared to the placebo group. Okay, so because this is a negative 0.8 percent, so if you uh, consider kind of 1,000 people, then it'll be kind of eight people right there. So, so kind of the reduced number should be kind of eight. So that's, that's kind of how to interpret, uh, interpret the result. And then the next one is relative risk. So in the uh, risk difference, we just kind of subtract, kind of subtract one proportion from the other proportion. So that's it. But then relative risk is kind of different. So it's a relative risk is a relative measure. So it's also called uh, relative ratio. And then the calculation is simple. So it's basically a ratio, ratio of two proportions. So one, uh, the proportion from the first group divided by uh, the proportion from the second group. So, so it's kind of relative measure. Then this is kind of the result for the, uh, our data. So relative risk of a heart attack in the aspirin group compared to the plus group, uh, placebo group is uh, 0 0.009. So this is the uh, proportion of a heart attack in the aspirin group. And then 0 0.017 is the proportion of a heart attack in the placebo group. So just kind of one proportion divided by the other one. So it will be 0 0.53. So that's the relative risk. Then how can you interpret this result? Then uh, the aspirin group is 0.53 times as likely to have heart attack uh, as the placebo group. So that is kind of how to interpret the result. On the other hand, you can interpret uh, kind of the other way. So if, if a patient kind of took aspirin, then kind of uh, the risk of a heart attack will be reduced by uh, forty-seven percent compared to the placebo group. Why forty-seven uh, percent? So this measure is fifty-three. So 
this if you compare this guy versus this guy, the proportion is 53. So this is the reference group. So kind of if you consider the reference group, then uh, then it'll, it'll be kind of 47% reducement right there. Okay, so it's basically one minus 0 0.53. So this is another way you, know, you can interpret the relative risk. So you can have kind of three kinds of relative risk. So the first one is relative risk is equal to exactly one. Then what is the re relative risk? Relative risk is the uh, one proportion divided by the other proportion. So if relative risk is equal to one, then two proportions are the same. So the risk of a heart attack in our example, for our example, the risk of a heart attack is the same for both groups. If relative risk is greater than one, then P1 is greater than P2. Right, so so in our case, the first group is the aspirin group. So so kind of for our example, we can interpret kind of risk of heart attack uh, for the aspirin group is higher than that for the uh, as, uh, placebo group. And then if relative risk is less than one, then it means the first proportion is less than the second proportion. So for our example, the risk of heart attack for the aspirin group is less than that for the uh, placebo group. So you can interpret it in that way. So this whole inter inter uh, interpretation depends on the reference group. So in our example, I, uh, I chose the, uh, the placebo group as the reference group. The reference group is the denominator. So, but then you don't have to follow kind of this kind of rule. So you can choose the uh, aspirin group as the reference group. So in this case, kind of relative risk of heart attack for the placebo versus aspirin is uh, 0 to, uh, 0 0.017 divided by 0 0.009. Remember, previously we calculated 0 0.009 divided by uh, 0.117. It's just the inverse of this measure here. Okay. So in this case, uh, the reference group is the aspirin group right there. Then kind of you have you will have relative risk uh, one point eighty nine. But then typically uh, when when people choose the reference group, they choose control group or uh, unexposed group as the reference group. That's the typical uh, choice. But then if you if you choose kind of the aspirin group as the reference group, then you should interpret it in a different way. Okay, so. If a patient kind of uh, took a placebo, uh, then the risk uh, would be about twice, exactly speaking, kind of 1.80 time, uh, 89, 89 times the risk of heart attack for the uh, aspirin group. Okay. So here, kinda I want to uh, kind of describe the difference between. Uh, risk difference and kind of relative risk. So risk difference is the basically one proportion minus the other proportion. So it's it's really absolute measure. But then um, relative risk is one proportion divided by the other proportion. So it's kind of relative measure. So for example, uh, let's consider just kind of two proportions, 10% and 20%. So in this case, what is the relative risk? So 10% divided by 20%, then 0.5. And then how about another example, 20% and 40%. In this case, relative, relative risk is the same, 20% divided by 40%. It's still kind of 0 0.5. But then if you consider uh, risk difference, kind of they are different. So for the first example, I mean 10% and 20%, then the risk difference will be 10 minus 20, so it'll be minus 10%. But um, for the second example, 20% uh, and 40%, then ris uh, the risk difference will be 20% minus 40% will be negative 20%. It's different. So risk difference uh, uh, gives us the, the absolute measure, but then um, relative, uh, relative risk gives us a relative measure. So that's the uh, difference. The last one is the odds ratio. Uh, actually, in statistics, kind of odds ratio is the most popular one. Uh, it has a lot of uh, reasons, but then um, I'll introduce kind of why odds ratio is popular kind of in several slides. So odds ratio 
So odds ratio is very similar to the uh, relative risk. Relative risk is the uh, ratio of two proportions. That's the relative risk. But then how about odds ratio? Odds ratio is the, is the ratio, ratio of two odds. So in that sense, kind of it's kind of very similar to the relative risk. But then the difference is relative risk, uh, they are using uh, proportions. But then odds ratio uses odds rather than proportions. So what is the odds? So here is the definition of odds. So odds for uh, odds is defined by uh, defined as this way. So probability of getting disease divided by one minus probability uh, probability or proportion of getting disease. Okay. So one minus uh, proportion of getting disease or uh, getting disease will be the same as probability of no disease. So that's the odds. So basically, you will obtain two odds. So for the first group, kind of for our example, for the aspirin group, you will have probable uh, proportion of heart attack divided by proportion of no heart attack for the aspirin group. So that is the odds number one. For odds number two, uh, in the placebo group, you will calculate the proportion of heart attack divided by proportion of no heart attack. Then you can simply obtain the ratio ratio of two odds. Okay, that's the odds ratio. Okay, let's calculate the two odds. So for the aspirin group, so uh, uh, re just uh, remember kind of the proportion of heart attack was 0 0.009. Then how can you calculate the odds for the aspirin group? So this is the uh, proportion of heart attack, 0 0.009 divided by one minus uh, proportion of heart attack. So it is kind of 0 0.0091. And then for the second odds, odds, uh, odds of heart attack for the uh, uh, placebo group, so our proportion of heart attack was uh, 0 0.017. So you can simply calculate the odds. So 0 0.17 divided by 1 minus 0 0.17, uh, 0 0.017. So it will be 0 0.0173. So odds ratio is simply uh, this guy divided by this guy. So here odds is a little kind of strange. So kind of odds is not the risk, but then um, it's a function of the risk. So here the risk means the proportion of heart attack or proportion of getting disease or something like that. So in the relative risk, as I explained, kind of they just compared kind of two proportions directly, but then. Um, uh, odds ratio use kind of very similar strategy. So they are comparing two odds, but um, not the proportions. So that's the difference. Then this is, then how can we uh, calculate the odds ratio? As I said, kind of just simply uh, the odds for the first group divided by odds for the second group. There will be odds ratio. So in our example, 0 0.0091 was the uh, odds uh, for the aspirin group, and then 0 0.0173 uh, is the odds for the placebo group. So if you calculate kind of this guy <coughs> divided by 0 0.0173, then it will be 0 0.526. That's the odds ratio. Then how can you interpret the odds ratio? So it's very similar to relative risk. So the odds of uh, heart attack for the aspirin group is 0.526 times the odds of heart attack for the placebo group. Or you can interpret it in a different way. So the aspirin group has 47% uh, 47.4% uh, reduction in the odds of heart attack compared to the placebo group. So you can use kind of either way for the interpretation. So odds ratio is very similar to relative risk. So kind of odds ratio has also three kinds of kind of odds ratio. So if odds ratio is equal to one, it means two odds are the same. And then if odds ratio is greater than one, then odds of heart attack for the aspirin for the aspirin group is higher than uh, that for the uh, that for the placebo group. And then if odds ratio is less than one, then 
as of heart attack for the uh, for the aspirin group is less than the, uh, less than that for the placebo group. Okay. So, uh, like the uh, relative risk kind of interpretation depends on the reference group. So, uh, like uh, as the uh, relative risk reference group is typically chosen. A control group is typically chosen for the reference group. So, but then um, if you uh, choose kind of the aspirin group for the reference group, then you can s simply kind of calculate the inverse of our original odds ratio. So, it is 0 0.0173 divided by 0 0.0091. So, it is 0 0.90. Then, how can you interpret that? So, interpretation is very similar to the relative risk. So, if Patients uh, took a placebo, then uh, it'll have uh, it would have kind of almost twice the odds of heart attack compared to the uh, to the aspirin group. Okay, so that's the interpretation. Then, kind of why odds ratio is so popular? So odds ratio has a really kind of huge disadvantage. It is hard to interpret. So that that's the kind of huge disadvantage. Then, but then why kind of uh, odds ratio is uh, very popular. So this is uh, kind of one of the reasons. So odd ratio and relative risk, they are very close, and then they have very uh, similar relationships. So in this case, if relative risk is less than 1, then odd ratio is also less than 1. If odd ratio is less than 1, relative risk is also less than 1. Okay, And then if odd ratio is equal to 1, relative risk, uh, rel uh, relative risk is also equal to 1. And then if odd ratio is greater than 1, then relative risk uh, is also greater than 1. So when you calculate the odd ratio, if odd ratio is greater than 1, then you may think the first group is more risky than the second group. Or if odd ratio is less than 1, then you can uh, interpret the kind of first, uh, first group uh, is less risky than the second group, something like that. So odd ratio is very close to uh, relative risk when the prevalence of disease, in our example, prevalence of a heart attack, uh, the proportion of a heart attack is very small. So, if, so when the prevalence uh, of disease is very small, odd ratio and uh, relative risk are very close. So in, this, in, our, uh, in our example, the overall risk of heart attack was 1.3%. It's very low. And then if you compare relative risk and odd ratio, yeah, they are very close. Uh, relative risk is 0.53, and then odd ratio is 0.526. So they are very close. So relative risk uh, is more interpretab uh, interpretable uh, than odd ratio. So intuitively, it's very easy to interpret. But then um, odd ratio, on the other end, odd ratio kind of is hard to interpret it. But then um, why kind of odd ratio is so popular? So the first uh, uh, first reason is kind of this relationship. So if odd ratio is, is greater than one, then the first group uh, is more risky than the second group, something like that. Then this is the kind of another really uh, big reason. So odd ratio uh, can be used for uh, cohort studies and case control studies. But then relative risk uh, uh, can be applied only for the cohort studies. So for example, uh, kind of let's assume kind of we want to investigate lung cancer, uh, the relationship between lung cancer and smoking. Then kind of kind of there are two ways to uh, for the study design. So the first design is just select kind of just 100 kind of lung uh, 100 patients with lung cancer, and then select another uh, 100 people without lung cancer. And then just ask, ask them kind of whether they are smoking or not. So it's a retrospective study. So this is the case control study. Okay. And then, but um, on the other hand, you can uh, design the study like this. So you can select 100 volunteers, uh, 100 non smokers, and then another 100 smokers. And then just to look at uh, whether they obtain, uh, whether they get kind of heart out, uh, or uh, lung cancer in five years or in kind of ten years, something like that. It's a longitudinal study or a prospective study. 
So that's the kind of core study. Okay. So in this case, kind of relative risk can be uh, only used for the core study only. So it, that there is a mathematical reason. So I I, I do not want to kind of go to uh, go into kind of details, but um, odds ratio mathematically kind of is possible to calculate in both ways. It's a really huge advantage. So if you are confused to kind of core studies or case control studies, then just use the odds ratio. Then it'll solve kind of all problems. But then when you apply kind of relative risk, kind of you should be very careful of kind of your study design. Okay, so it's a really huge advantage. So there are a number of kind of reasons why odds ratio is popular in statistics, but then that those are really theoretical reasons. But then so this is uh, maybe the really biggest reason why kind of people use just odds ratio rather than relative risk. Okay, and then next to kind of uh, uh, just to look at kind of comparing two proportions. So especially with the small sample sizes, uh, you may he uh, heard about chi-square test or two sample G test. So that those are really uh, the kind of very popular methodologies to compare two proportions. But then theory, uh, in theory, kind of they assume kind of large samples. So the rule of thumb uh, is that cell count, uh, cell count should be at least five. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, but, then there, but then people, yeah, it depends, but then some people say kind of it is 10, but then many people just think kind of at least five, then typically it's okay. But then those kind of chi-square tests and two sample G tests are based on some approximation okay, from the large sample sizes. Then how about kind of if you have very small sample size? then how can you compare two proportions? That's a question. So typically uh, people just use Fisher's exact, Fisher's exact test. So I, al so I always use Fisher's exact test for the, this kind of data. So Fisher's exact test doesn't have any uh, minimum sample size requirement. So, but then um, chi-square test and two sample G test, they, okay, questions? Oh, sure. So two sample G test uh, is uh, based on kind of normal approximation. So you have two proportions, right? So uh, in the two sample G test, you can compare kind of one proportion minus the other one. Then suppose kind of the difference is 0 0.16, something like this, just 0 0.6, uh, yeah, 0 0.16. And then you might, so you want to look at kind of if uh, whether there is kind of statistical significance or not. So something like that. So in the case, kind of, uh, if you use some formula or a statistical kind of program, then it will give you the p-value. So based on the p-value, you can uh, conclude kind of there is a uh, strong statistical evidence for that or not, something like that. That's the two sample G test. And then chi-square test is a little different, but then basically they are doing the same thing. So. So, so suppose we have two variables. So kind of you might want to uh, look at kind of if there is any association between two variables. Then chi-square test is the kind of you can typically they, uh, people create kind of two by two table and then just apply the formula. So that form, based on the, that formula, uh, if the sample size is really huge, that test statistic follows chi-square distribution. So, but then for the two sample G test, it's, uh, it's based on the normal approximation. It's, they use different uh, kind of statistical distri uh, distributions, but then uh, based on the chi-square table, then kind of you can uh, test whether there is an association or not. So if there is an association, then kind of it's like kind of two proportions will be different. So if two proportions are the same, there is no association. So can you see what I mean? Yeah, something like that. So. Uh, although they use kind of different uh, kind of formulas or different statistical distributions, but um, they are doing the same thing. So, yeah, either way is okay. So, but then um, uh, again, they need kind of large samples. So whole theory is based on kind of just assuming large samples. But then um, if you have kind of very small sample size and they still want to uh, look at the difference between two proportions or associations, then what kind of kind of test we can use? So. 
I strongly recommend the kind of Fisher zigzag test. So it doesn't have any uh, minimum sample size requirement, and then it gives exact p value, not the approximate p value like kind of chi square test or two sample g test. It'll give you exact p value, and then but then this advantage is that kind of it is hard to kind of calculate by, uh, calculate the test statistic by hand. So you always need kind of computer power. So that's the disadvantage. And then, but um, uh, many, people, uh, many people think kind of Fisher's exact test is appropriate for uh, small sample sizes only, but um, that's not true, okay? Fisher's exact test is always appropriate kind of for large samples as well as, well as small sample sizes, okay? So actually in practice, I always use Fisher's exact test first, but um, uh, the another kind of great disadvantage of uh, Fisher's exact test is that if you have a huge number of sample size, then it may take a long time to calculate, calculate it, although you, uh, even if you use a computer, okay? So uh, just kind of to me, kind of I just tried the Fisher's exact test first, then if kind of computation is really quick, then just I use that result. But um, if, if kind of it looks like it takes a really, really long time, then just I just quit and then just use chi-square test and two sample g-test. But um, Fisher's exact test is always appropriate for large sample size and small sample size, okay? Not only for the small sample size, okay? So let's look at the example. So this, uh, this data was published in uh, British Medical Journal in 1986. So they just compare the kind of uh, eye vision health of kind of juvenile uh, delinquent boys in a control group. So outcome is whether or not kind of the boy wears glasses. So they want to compare kind of proportion of kind of uh, wearing glasses kind of uh, in both groups. So this is the data. The data is really, really small. So, you know, couple of kind of cell counts is less than five. And then even the other accounts are really small. So in this case, kind of if you use a chi-square test or two-sample g-test, then uh, you may be in trouble. The result may not be reliable at all because their theory is based on large samples. So in this case, you can use kind of Fisher's exact test. So here, so they obtained the 16 boys. This, the, that's the total number of boys in this, uh, in this study. And then there are nine delinquent boys, okay? And then there are seven non-delinquent boys. So one out of nine boy uh, wear, uh, wears glasses here. And then five out of seven uh, kind of wear glasses. So we want to compare two proportions. So basically one over nine versus five, uh, yeah, one over nine versus kind of five divided by seven. And then kind of we want to uh, whether there is st uh, strong statistical evidence for that, okay? So if you use Fisher's exact test, I, I want to go into details for the Fisher's exact test formula. It's very messy. So but then if you use a computer, then it'll, uh, it'll produce a exact p-value. So p-value is 0 0.035. So if you, if you use kind of 0.05, uh, for the significance level, it's kind of we should reject the null hypothesis. So null hypothesis is two proportions are the same. So we so because p value uh, is less than 0 0.05, so we reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So that's the Fisher's exact test. So here uh, here is conclusion. So for the categorical data, there are a number of ways to express the data graphically, but um. Uh, bar chart uh, may be a good way to express your data. And then we have kind of, we have investigated three measures of associations. So risk difference, relative risk, and odds ratio. So risk difference uh, gives you an absolute measure. And then, but then relative risk gives you a relative measure. And the odds ratio is also a relative measure. But then odds ratio has some advantages over relative risk, especially odds ratio can be used for the uh, cohort studies and case control studies. So that's a really great advantage over uh, relative risk. And then 
also uh, if relative risk less than 1 then odds ratio is less than 1 if uh, relative risk is greater than 1 odds ratio is also greater than 1 that's also kind of very promising kind of relationship so based on the uh, that kind of relationship you can interpret the odds ratio is greater than 1 then first group uh, is more risky than the second group something like that okay and then yeah efficiency exacts can be used for the uh, comparing two proportions even uh, with uh, small sample sizes. But um, uh, again, Fisher's exact test is always appropriate for large sample size as well as small sample sizes, okay? But um, it may take a while. So in, in the kind of when your sample size is really, really huge, then uh, just use a chi-square test and then, or kind of two sample G test, so then it'll be really quick. Okay, so here is our CTS, uh, CTSI kind of website. So if you go to website, then you can uh, you can find kind of our kind of materials. And then here is a kind of biostatistics consulting service. So www.mcw.edu slash biostats kind of consult, um, biostats consult dot htm. And then we provide kind of uh, free dropping consulting service at uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, and the VA Hospital, and Marken University. So if you just drop by kind of the office uh, kind of these times, then kind of we can provide kind of free consulting service. So if your consultant, uh, sometimes kind of kind of kind of they have kind of hard questions to answer at the uh, at the po uh, at the point, then kind of they discuss with kind of the other faculty members, then kind of it'll kind of they will give you some some sort of answer for that so please kind of be uh, be aware of that okay so that's all for today okay any other questions <laughs>